Today we are starting a new sermon series to give nourishment to our summer of caring and service. We begin in the wilderness. I invite you to imagine how the people were feeling. Only a few months ago, they never thought they would be in this position. What happened was that Pharaoh had been oppressing the Israelites in Egypt. They lived in a system of violent subjugation and they knew it and God knew it. And with help from Moses, God made a way out of slavery by making a path of dry land across the Red Sea so the people could walk across to the other side. When the Egyptian soldiers came after them, God closed up the sea, drowning the slave catchers and their horses. Now it could be the Israelites imagined arriving in paradise as a land flowing with milk and honey. Now their miraculous escape was more than two months ago and they find themselves here in the wilderness. I mean, seriously, this is the promised land? This is what liberation looks like? The people complained out loud. Why did God bother rescuing us just to bring us here? What is God even doing? According to the scripture, one answer is testing the people. The Bible says God heard the whining and moaning of the congregation. And the Lord said to Moses, I know I will test the people to see whether they do what I say. And so the Lord our God decided to give the people the food they were craving, but here's the deal. They must only gather enough food for that day. No missing a collection, no hoarding extra. Let's see if the people can follow my test. So says the Lord our God. Or, so says the human people who crafted the stories we find in the Bible. If you happen to be wondering whether the Lord our God really tested the people or whether that's really what the storytellers decided, then yeah, I am wondering that too. Only a few months earlier, the Israelites had no idea that they would wind up here and oh my goodness, we can relate. Only a few months ago, we thought the pandemic would be an event. Once it hit, we rallied, we surged with crisis adrenaline. We leaned into caring and serving and staying at home. But then the disaster didn't end. We thought we would arrive safely on the other side. And if there is an other side, we sure haven't reached it yet. People are still getting sick. People are afraid they will die in isolation without being able to say goodbye to the ones they love. Some funerals have been indefinitely postponed. Some of us are thick in grief. Some of us have lost our jobs. Some are reeling from canceled plans. Some of us are drowning from being locked inside. How long, oh Lord, what is God even doing? When this is our question, it makes good sense that we would come up with a theory. So something that we human people have been saying to each other is, Surely God must be testing us. I mean, think about it. If God is testing us, 
That means God is still in charge. This is somehow part of her plan. And even better, if God is testing us, then there is something we can do to get an A. We have some control. We human people love tests. They give us a mastery of knowledge, a method of overcoming the unknown with measurable information. It makes perfect sense. No wonder we want to decide that our experience of struggle is really the opportunity for us to prove to God that we are worthy is just... I'm not so sure it's true. What kind of God pours out suffering on people just so he can stand back with his clipboard and see whether we are faithful enough to pass the test? That's not God. As it turns out, even in our Bible story today, God is doing something else entirely. The first thing God does is listen to the people who are complaining. He doesn't just hear that they are complaining. God hears what they are saying, and he realizes what the problem really is. Then, the Lord our God lets his own heart be moved by the sorrow of the people. The next thing God does is show up on the scene. Moses told Aaron to tell the people to draw near and lift their eyes. And in the middle of the wilderness, the glory of the Lord appeared to them in the cloud so the people would know God had heard them. Next in the story, I love this part. What God does is provide the food and not metaphorical food, not conceptual food, actual food. In the evening, the people would eat meat from the quails. In the morning, the people would eat bread from what the quails left behind. And yes, (laughs) It is exactly what you are thinking. The facts are these. First, manna is quail poop. It looks like coriander seed and tastes like wafers with honey. Yeah. Second, when the people were starving and weeping in the wilderness with no end in sight, God interrupted their suffering to give them something to eat. This meal plan was not a prize reserved for those who exhibited the most righteousness. Everybody needs dinner. Everybody gets dinner. We human people keep inventing tests and evaluating tests and deciding that God must be doing the same. But the Lord our God keeps on interrupting our tests with mercy. Food is a tangible expression of grace. In the middle of all our elaborate human schemes to figure out who's really at fault or who owes what, it's like God comes into the room and in her mom voice says, you all need to stop It's time for lunch. Imagine if one day we could believe this grace is the truth. Taste and see the Lord is good. Imagine if we believed it so vividly that we couldn't help but share God's grace. If we learned how to respond to what people need instead of what we think they deserve. If we could let our own hearts be moved. Decades ago, I worked as a camp counselor for a summer. 
And church camp is terrific. I could go on and on for hours about how amazing church camp is. The food at camp, that was a struggle for me. Now, I typically avoid red meat, and usually that worked out okay until the day it did not. I didn't plan to do this, and I am not proud of it, but when I got up to the lunch line and saw that there was no red meat option, I complained out loud in front of everybody. I said to the camp director, Donna, what am I supposed to eat? And I, I saw her eyes flash with anger, and in the most furious, calm voice, she said, there is always peanut butter. And she was right. And I knew I was wrong. How ungrateful. How unprofessional. I mean, I am literally getting paid to be at camp. Come on. I mean, what kind of example was I setting? So that night at dinner, the camp director needed to speak to me in the kitchen. And I thought I could see exactly where this was headed. But when I got there, it turns out that Gail, the woman who cleaned the camps, needed to talk to me. She was standing by the stove and she said, I'm a vegetarian, so I always bring something to make for myself. She started dishing up a bowl of rice with broccoli and peppers. She said, here, I made vegetable stir fry. I have extra. And Donna thought you might want some. Yeah. I will tell you, it was amazing. I wish this meal on everyone I know. And the way I remember what next, the way I remember what happened next was this. I started to say something to Donna, but before I could find the words, she said, I knew what the problem was, semicolon. And you and I know there would be many correct second halves to that sentence, like you were being entitled and ungrateful, or you weren't exhibiting camp ethos in front of the children. A whole lot of things were the problem. If this were a test, I would have failed, but get this. Donna went with, I knew what the problem was. You were hungry. That's amazing. Donna made the decision to look past how I was acting out in order to see what I needed. Make no mistake, this is the work of grace, the work of God. And imagine if we learned how to do this for each other, if our first instinct was not to judge someone for how they were acting, not even to judge someone for rioting, but instead ask, what need do they have that is going unmet? Could I help meet that need? Now I know in our world, Asking this question is not a common first impulse, but what if it could be? Because maybe the other person is not really lazy or criminal or out to scam the system. Maybe they're not really a spoiled camp counselor or a thug. Maybe this other person is harboring a deep need and maybe it is up to us to see what it is. You might remember back in February on Food Pantry Sunday, Mike Miller, who's the president of the Riverbend Food Bank, came and spoke with our adult forum and he shared this insight with our church. He said, Sometimes folks get worried about whether the people who come to food pantries are legitimately in need or whether they are taking advantage. Well, rest assured, after years in this profession, he has developed a test 
to determine whether someone really needs the food. The test goes like this. Did they show up at the food pantry? If so, that's it. They need the food. Instead of worrying about somebody else's deservedness, we could see their need and help address it. The Lord our God will hear our condemning and our complaining. God hears our protest and is moved with compassion. God allows her own heart to break. Her tears get mingled with our tears. And when we are on the streets or in jail or in the wilderness, Jesus comes into the world to go with us. I know what you need, he says. Here, sit down. This is my body. Take and eat. This is the work of grace, the work of God. And you and I know this could be our work too. Amen.